Welcome back to Metal Tips and Tricks. Today, I'm going to show you how to build this lamp. Jennifer just picked this up at a uh, junk store someplace, and it's just really a cool gauge. I was trying to figure out what to do with it, and I went, I know. Let's uh, add some electricity to it, put an Edison light bulb on it, and see what happens. I think all good projects start with uh, scrap parts. Here we're just going to go through and find some miscellaneous things. We've got some half-inch pipe, got some wire, needs some steel. Well, like I said, I always like projects that start out with a scrap pile first. Here we've got that gauge. Now what I wanted to try to do is set this gauge up on a base of some sort, but we need a place to run the wires and also put a new style of, what do I want to say, lampshade. So here we go. I'm going to be able to run the wires through this half inch pipe and we're going to cut it to length here on the bandsaw. Go over to the cabinet with all the toolboxes, and each box has something different. Uh, nope, we don't need a belt sander. Ah, there we go. The electric pipe threader. This actually comes from Harbor Freight. Um, it's a mixed blessing. I've used it about 200 times now. The machine itself is fine. Dies for cutting the threads. You know, they just don't do a good job. But in the case that I'm working with, I'm not doing any plumbing. I just do this for decorative furniture. You can see I'm also going past where I need to go. I've found in the past that that makes it easier for me to screw the uh, pipe joints on for projects like this. But it's not a good thing to do for plumbing. You'll get leaks. Here we go. We're going to figure out where we want to put this base. And I know I want the base. I want round corners on it. Using these flange worked great for making those radiuses. And just kind of studying this a bit, I realized that the size of the base is going to be just a little bit too small. So I'm going to remeasure it a little bit here. I want to get the gauge a certain distance, the back of it a certain distance. So we're going to end up making this more of a rectangle than a square base. Again, making the radiuses, taking it over to the bandsaw, and cutting this out. Now I could also use the plasma cutter on this. Oh! Did you see that? I've been having problems with this bandsaw lately. Uh, the blade's slipping. One reason is the blade that's on here is an incredibly coarse blade. And uh, it does cause me some problems. And I'm sure there's going to be some trolls that want to talk about how high I've got the blade guard up. Here we're just polishing off the corners on a sander. This is a fantastic way to do it. Very quick. Again, like I said, I could use a plasma cutter, but it's faster sometimes just to go with, well, the old systems. Putting the flange right in the center, marking four holes, going over the drill press. Going to drill this out. I'm going to actually do several different size drill bits. I like to start out with a pilot hole and then go to something larger. Yes, I'm not using any um, oils on this. Sometimes oils just cause more of a mess. I'd rather just sharpen the drill bits, sometimes a little bit faster. And cleaning up the oil mass. Okay, sizing up all the holes, making sure I get the bolts all the way in. Now one of the things is I'm going to be running the wires right through the center and I just don't want to rub up against steel. So what I've got is uh, rubber grommets. You can get this kit of grommets from Harbor Freight for about three or four bucks. Well worth buying. They're not high quality, but for a project like this, they're just perfect. So I'm drilling halfway in, flipping the plate over. Drilling a hole larger on both sides, trying to develop a shoulder. Well, it didn't work very well, so I had to go in with a countersink bit, so now I've got a nice clean shoulder that I can fit that rubber grommet on. Now we're over at the lathe, and we are making four individual feet for the base. 
I wanted to raise it up a little bit also for a place for the cord to go. And this is just a simple process except, actually let's back this up right here. So here we are doing an instant replane. If you look closely, you can see that the cutter is actually sliding back into the holder. All right, there we go. See how that's moving? Just didn't have a good grip on it. I need to make a new holder and someday I'll actually do that, but this one here is working now. You can also see uh, right up here, you'll see that the material will bend on me and it'll jump a little bit. It would help if I had the material closer to the three-jaw chuck, but I didn't want to waste any time and these weren't that critical, so I was just powering through them. I also like using a cutter that has an eighth inch wide. They just don't break that easy. Plenty of oil. This is one time when I just have to pile the oil on. I hate the oil. You'll see it on my hands a little bit later. It just makes a horrible mess. But you cannot cheat it on this. Next we're going to go to the welding process. We're going to weld these feet onto the base. I didn't do a lot of cleanup. We're going to TIG weld these so we don't have a big weld bead. We're also not going to use any filler rod. See, you can see the oil on my hands because I came straight over from the lathe to put these on. No wasting time in fabrication. Remember, this is not machining. This is fabricating. We've got the uh, Lincoln uh, TIG 200 square wave. We're going to crank it all the way up. We're only running this on 110 volt electricity. Works really, really, really well. It's an impressive machine. This is what's fun here. You can see when I add the heat, look at that foot. It lifts right up because of too much heat on one side. So we're going to have to put a clamp in there, hold it down. We're going to TIG weld all the way around these. And again, no filler rods needed. Here we're putting the flange on. You can see all four feet into position. And now we're just going to do a loose fit up, see how everything's going. Make sure there's no serious problems. It's kind of taking shape. You guys can kind of see what I'm trying to do here. I see I've got a little challenge here. Later on I actually end up welding these into position. I find what lines up and just weld them in instead of try to over tighten them. It just works out a little better. I got a little rock. I ended up grinding off one of the feet to level that out so that rock went away. I could have spent a little more time on the uh, lathe, but also just grinding them off didn't really matter because, again, this is fabrication. There you guys get a view of kind of what it is going to look like. And boom, of course. Always mistakes when you're working too fast. Now, the process of making this lens shade is kind of unique. I had this idea, thought it would work out really well. In the end, it did. I cut these uh, steel discs out and then tried to clamp them together and then I was going to turn them around in the lathe. I cut them on the um, plasma cutter. As you can see I had some difficulties drilling through. I ended up setting a bolt all the way through the wood and the uh, steel plates. Kind of made more of a sandwich or I guess in this case a hamburger. And I thought this was a great idea. I knew I was going to have some problems but well they just kept compounding. I did finally work through them. To keep this bolt from uh, getting knocked out of position during the turning because there's a lot of stress on it, I put a center drill on it, drilled out the center of the bolt, and then went in with the black center. Changing out the cutter here, just a nice simple braised on carbide. Here is one of the challenges, is you want to turn this very delicately. Well, when you're used to turning steel and just power throwing it, and you're not having a problem with slippage, well, let's just say I had a lot of slipping on this. So it was an education. I kept tightening it up. Eventually, I did work through it. It just took me a lot longer than I wanted. And uh, the final results was excellent. It just didn't work as well in my head or in theory as I was hoping it would. Something I've said in the past about working with wood on your metalworking equipment. One thing I like about it is that it sucks up all the oil that is uh, been embedded on top of the steel, so it's kind of fun to uh, use wood every once in a while just to kind of keep your machines cleaned. I know it's not proper procedure, but you know, that's okay. So now we're going to cut into the metal a little bit, and as you can see, it's way, way off center. 
and I'm definitely struggling with it, you know, taking my time, trying to prove that I have patience. And, uh, well, you'll see things work well and things don't work well sometimes. You can see the lathe just doesn't like to cut things that are not perfectly round. I'm getting some slipping. If you see the arm that holds down my Alora's tool post, the vibrations in the whole machine is causing that to loosen up. So you can see it's not working well. Now there was another plan that I had um, to make this work a little better and a little later I show you that. But I'm showing you the mistakes that occurred during this process. One right here is I just didn't have the room with the tool post the way it was set up. So I took the compound, uh, rotated it around so I'd have a little bit more room for that larger diameter. Okay, let's try this again and see how it works out. As you can see, all the work I put into it before, when all the discs slipped, they're all in a different alignment now. And basically, it's from like starting over again. Now, the total time to turn this disc down to where it was usable was probably in the neighborhood of about 30 minutes. I thought I could do it in five minutes, of course just my engineering process to hold these discs together was not, well, just didn't work at all as you can tell. So here we are working on the final pass, getting it cleaned up. It looks okay, had a little chatter problem that I wasn't too happy with, but at the end of the day, these are just steel discs. This is fabrication like I keep repeating. And I did like the final results when this was done. Right here what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a mark in the end of this. And that's going to serve, that line is going to serve where I'm going to drill four holes. So they're all going to be at the same distance all the way around. And also the same distance from the outer edge of the steel discs. And I felt this was the best way to just mark it, get it set in there. So let's pull this thing out of the lathe and uh, look at it a little closer in what we're trying to do here. Now I'm trying to set up for the four holes. Now I know I can use trigonometry and figure out exactly where to place these, but I'm a little bit faster just trial and error. Um, I should have used a set of dividers, but they're upstairs, so these uh, are what I'm using out of these calipers. And you just basically mark around, you look at the difference between the four, add a little more, subtract a little more, check it, and you're done within a few minutes. Now, if this was something really critical, it would be a different story. But this isn't a critical project or a critical how these holes line up. Now just drilling the four holes, nothing too fancy here just getting her done. So now let's take it over the lathe and show you the process here. First of all, I need to take the jaws off so I can fit the new steel sandwich in place. Just need to flip them around, get more grip, more room. Now the bolting of the steel plates was pretty easy, straightforward. And there was a large enough hole in the center that I can actually start to work from there. Always take time to clean your jaws when you're taking them on them off. Just if you're gonna, even if you're gonna do a, just a quick job, it's about not damaging the jaws later by just clamping them in there with some dust in there. It's not always about alignment, it's about keeping your lathe jaws in excellent shape. So here we're going to drill the hole out uh, quite a bit larger. If I can drill it, um, I'll drill it to take out material because I can move a lot more material faster with a drill bit than I can with a boring bar. Okay, now let's start to bore this out with a boring bar. How did you hear that little tap? Yeah, that's one of the screws actually hitting the compound. 
You can see uh, one of them in there, I think, is bent. So I got to lengthen out the uh, boring bar. You know, you try to keep the boring bar as short as possible. This time I was a little too short. I could have cut those bolts off a little bit also, but uh, this will be fine. So here we are going up for the final cuts. And we're getting ready to check the light bulb to see how it looks. Light bulb looks perfect. Here are all the plates all finished up. And I'm going to show you kind of the process that I did here. One thing I didn't do was keep track of the plates themselves and in what order. So I have to go through here, realign them, and then take a marker so I know exactly what the proper orientation is for each disc. And it's just a matter of trial and error, kind of a mistake you make every once in a while. Okay, I make this mistake quite often when I do things like this. Now I'm setting up uh, the nuts on the all thread and I'm running them right to the center. I'm going to start with the disc in the center and then measure out from there. Another way you could do this was actually use steel tubing or brass tubing or aluminum tubing. I thought about that. I couldn't find steel tubing and I wanted the steel tubing because I want the rust look on it. Brass could have been beautiful but it I would have had to wait for it to tarnish out, or actually I would have had to tarnish the brass to make it fit right. So I decided this was the better procedure. And I could also have more flexibility of how I wanted it to look and measure it out. It took quite a while to get this assembled, but I think it was well worth the experiment. I'm basing some other lampshade designs on this that I'm really excited about. Larger scale, of course. Uh, sometimes it's fun to just build a small scale. I've got one that I'd love to do that's in the three foot range. Uh, chandelier that would hang off the ceiling, but we'll see when I get time for that one. Weight is a uh, challenge with that, but it could be a beautiful, beautiful lampshade. So now I'm just kind of trial and error, checking the measurements, going all the way around with my calipers. Long, long process. So I'm not going to show you everything. You'll get to see it finished up here in a little bit. Now we go for the magic finish. And this bucket here is uh, acetic acid. And this is going to etch all the metal so it allows my instant rust to get in there. And the instant rust is a simple chemical I'll talk about in a little bit. And yes, I'm not wearing gloves. Sorry guys, every once in a while you just are working so fast you just forget to. And I'm sure you've all done that. So if the trolls don't like that, that's uh, your issue. I don't think you should be sticking your hands in acid. Uh, but we do make mistakes every once in a while. So I can see I need a little bit more water in there. So I'm going to fill that up. And then this is going to soak for quite a while. I'll let it soak. Um, you know, actually it only needs about an hour or two. But usually I'll let it soak an entire day. There's other things to get in there and etch. And really what you're after here is an etching process. You want to dig into the steel because remember what we're trying to do by rusting it is oxidizing it. So there we go. We got a better look to see all the activity going on. So everything's successful here. You do want to make sure this is cleaned off because this is acid and water. If there's any oil on it, it's just not going to etch as well. Now one mistake I left is I left this bucket on the cement overnight and the acid that dripped down the side actually etched a half moon into the concrete. Here's our instant rust and you're going to see you just spray that on there and it just activates almost instantly. Pretty amazing. Uh, the instant rust is nothing fancy. It is um, hydrogen peroxide, salt, and vinegar. And I forget what the ratios are. Someday I'll do a whole um, video just on this solution. But it's pretty simple. You can probably find it on the internet someplace. Keep working it. Now I pulled these straight out of the acid bath and went right to the instant rust. And then I'll just let this set. I have different attitudes for letting it set. Sometimes I want to set it for an hour. Sometimes I'll let it set overnight. One thing you do got to be cognizant of is you need to wash it off later because you want to get rid of the salt. Lacquer finish that I put on this later doesn't like the salt, so uh, you got to watch out for that. Also, if you can just keep it wet, uh, it works better than if you let it dry out. Because sometimes you dry, if it dries out, the um, salt will actually cake and doesn't come off easily, and you have to do another acid bath. 
So we're going to let that soak, clean it up, and then it's time to start assembling it and running the wires. One of my favorite tricks to running wire is to take a string and pull it through with a vacuum. If you try to just push the wire through, you're going to find out there's a lot of interference inside a pipe like that. You have threads, you have the end of pipes, it just doesn't work. Use a vacuum to pull the string through, and now you just tie the wire right onto the string. Now one of the tricks I've learned here is you want to have the string come right off the end of the wire. You don't want that wire to bend over at any particular point. And there's a technique that I use. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You'll have to experiment and find out what works for you because what worked on one project doesn't work on another. So there is a, quite a bit of trial and error here. Now here's where I make that crucial, crucial decision. How long do I make the wire? I have no really good answer for it. All I know is I never want to find out I cut it too short. So I usually give an extra quite a bit. This is probably eight feet would be my guess. Now we want to set up, put that grommet back in. And that grommet is really going to save us someday. It's going to prevent that wire from chafing and getting cut and cause an electrical short. And it's just kind of a nice little addition to anything you do is to go that extra step. So here's a mistake I've made multiple times when doing wiring is I get a little too excited and start putting things together. Well, what I did here is I put this component in place that holds the lampshade on well before the lampshade was in place. So here we go. Now we're getting the right order. Don't have a lot of room to work. I'm going to strip these down, fit it in there. There we go. Now, I use really, really nice components on these. I don't like the cheap ones that you go to Home Depot or Lowe's to buy. Definitely want to go online, buy the better stuff. I'll put a connection or link in the description where you can get this wire and also these sockets. Stripping back the insulation, make sure I've got enough room. Taping up to make sure there's no shorts. Doing a nice little assembly here. If you guys like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe and share this video. And remember, until next time, go out in your shop, build something cool. Thanks.